I'll never forget the first day that I met Mr. Washington. I, I was born in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City. I was born in an abandoned building on a floor with a twin brother. And when we were six weeks of age, we were adopted. And when I was in the fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I fell again when I was in the eighth grade. I don't have any college education, but because of my mother, and I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. I saw a sign once that said that God took me from my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. So my first major goal was to buy my mother a home, to take care of my mother. And, and I did that, took care of her until she passed at 88. But I'll never forget when I met Mr. Washington, I was in a class waiting on another student, and, and he came in and he said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for us. I said, oh, sir, I, I, I can't do that. He said, why? I said, I'm not one of you students. He said, look at me. I said, yes, sir, go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I said, sir, I, I can't do what you're asking me to do. He said, why? Sir, because I'm, I'm educable, mentally retarded, sir. And as the students erupted in laughter, he came from behind his desk, he looked at me and he said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that was a turning point in my life. On one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated. Because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe who said, look at a man the way that he is. He only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be. Then he becomes what he should be. And so Mr. Washington, he challenged me. And I want to challenge you right now about raising your goals. And, and I want you to shake someone's hand on your right and left, look them in the eyes and say, stretch yourself. I grew up in New Orleans. My mother worked as a daycare assistant at the Jewish Community Center. The man that I was told was my father was a carpenter and a functional alcoholic. He was abusive to my mother and I, so needless to say, for most of my younger years, I was angry. And by the time I entered into adolescence, I was furious. God knew I needed points of light. So he gave me a praying mother, not more than a baby herself. When she married this man, she tried her best to protect me from him. But with no life skills of her own, she did what she knew how to do. But oh, how she loved me. Friday was payday for him, so he would come home happy but that was short-lived. He would go out and return a few hours later drunk and angry, yelling and fighting her. And as I watched in horror, God knew that this little boy needed points of light. This happened every Friday and every Saturday night, but come Sunday morning, my mother would come in the room and wake me up, shake me in my chest and say, come on, baby, let's go to church. When we get there, I would see my mother up in the choir singing happy, rocking, talking about, thank you, Jesus. I remember being a little boy wanting to know this God, this Jesus that made my mother so happy. She said, baby, I'm going to teach you how to be a Christian, the real one. You know, the ones with flaws that makes mistakes, the ones that God himself used in the Bible, that kind not these perfect pretending holy rollers, she called them, you know? She taught me that God loved me and oh, what a point of light he has been for me. Now, I'm sorry, I know it's not politically correct to talk about God and faith these days, these days but oh well, they gave me a microphone. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to be myself. It was my mother teaching me about God and faith that allowed me to forgive my father and also to be able to understand them both. Now that I'm older, I realize that my parents had no examples. They were two wounded children trying to raise a wounded child. Years later, I would enter, I would enter into show business not knowing that I was carrying a desire to share what I had learned and witnessed growing up not knowing that the very people that had made me laugh and made me cry and made me happy, made me sad, and literally had made me, were showing up in my work. Their lives, their stories, their hopes, their dreams, their despair, were all on display in my films and my storytelling. I only wanted to bring laughter and light now because I had seen so much darkness growing up. I was writing about things that were raw and guttural, my own experiences, so much so that it made the critics uncomfortable. It was crass and abrasive to the trained eye. 
offensive, they called it. But while they were writing their reviews, I was receiving emails and likes on Facebook by the millions from people all around the world who got it. Like the letter I got from a woman who said, my sister saw a diary of a mad black woman, and you did in two hours what my family has been trying to do for 12 years. She's leaving an abusive relationship. Yeah. It was the point of light. Or the letter that I got from a mother of a little boy in Houston who has autism, and she was telling me that it's my shows that keep him calm enough to go to sleep in the evening, a point of light. Or the single mother who sent me an email saying that she had had it and she was going to commit suicide. She rented a hotel room and she wanted to spend the last day with her kids. So she brought them to this hotel and she said, anything you guys want to do, you let me know. One of them said, I want to watch one of Tyler Perry's plays. So they watched the show. And after they watched it, she was no longer depressed. She found herself laughing and happy and joyous. And she no longer wanted to commit suicide. That's a point of light. It feels great to be able to lift people on this level, but you also have the power to lift people even if you don't have this platform. Yeah, see, see, I think that, that you really have to stretch yourself to discover your stuff. I think that we have to really begin to experiment with life. And I said that you have something special. I didn't say that just to be kind of courteous, you do. See, I think that there are not many people that come to seminars or workshops or will watch a program of this nature. Why? I just think that most people are just satisfied to where they are. I'm, I'm reminded of a man one day he was walking down the street and he passed his porch where some people were on the porch talking and there was a dog moaning and groaning. And he was curious why the dog was moaning and groaning and he, he went back and he said, um, excuse me, he asked the owner, why is the dog moaning and groaning? The guy said, because he's laying on a nail. He said, well, why won't he get off? He said, it's not hurting bad enough for him to get off. Just hurting bad enough to moan and groan. How many of you know people who should be here? Raise your hands, please. How many of you know people all they do is moan and groan? Raise your hands. <laughs> moan and groan. I, I, I'm not making enough money. Moan and groan. I, I'm, I'm unhappy with my job. 87% of people go to jobs that they hate. And in addition to that, you know, the, as we know that, that we have the dubious distinction in this country that on, on Monday morning, the heart attack rate increases over 35% on Monday morning between 6 o'clock and 9. People going to jobs that they hate. The heart said, didn't I tell you I didn't want to go? And attack them. <laughs> Some of you don't want to go to work next Monday. <laughs> So the thing is this, so you want to find out what resonates with you. What is it you really want to do? You want to experiment with life and find out what fits for you. You have something special. You have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. See, I believe that anybody through observation and practice can perform at the level of excellence. But when you're pursuing your greatness, and this is worth writing down, you don't know what your limits are, and you act like you don't have any. So I say to you, you have something special. You have greatness within you. The problem with greatness, when you have greatness, greatness to you might escape your mind because your greatness is also in your normal. Things that you step over, things that you overlook, things that you take for granted, things that might not be valuable to you because you are inundated and saturated with them are valuable to other people around the world. I was just talking to a gentleman the other day who said he exports artwork from this country and then resells it in other countries at three times and four times the price that you pay, for, that you sell it for retail over here. We all have to think differently. There are no barriers. There are no restrictions. There are no limitations. You can go as far as you want to go if you know how to work it right. You got to start thinking differently. Your marketplace may not just be your neighborhood. It may be your world. I had the reason I'm standing on this stage today is because our world is much smaller. We are interconnected. We are interdependent, and that's why we need each other. 
in order to succeed. Children, who would have thought? And I look at you, I say, you have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. No one could have convinced me that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. You know, the easiest thing I do every year is, is go into a sales organization and dramatically increase their sales or go into a prison and, and enable prisoners to see themselves differently and teach them the methods and techniques of how to plug into the system or motivate young people to begin to, to see how they can have a vision of themselves in the future and fit. That's the easiest thing I do to, or train a speaker to help them to leverage their experience as a speaker and say, look, speaking is a projection of who you are, not who you think you ought to be and come with power from a platform. That's the easiest thing I've ever done. Let me share with you the most difficult thing I've ever done. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do what I'm now doing. No one could have convinced me, just given my circumstances, I earn millions of dollars every year. No one could have convinced me. If, if both my parents came up here right now, I, I would not know either one. No one could have convinced me, being labeled educable, mentally retarded, born in an abandoned building on the floor in Liberty City, poor section of Miami, Florida, failing twice in school, no college training, never worked for a major corporation. I did not know. I can do what I'm doing right now. I'll never forget Mike Williams, my mentor. One, I think a lot of people fail in life because of the fact that they need some mentoring. They need some coaching. Uh, repeat out to me, please. You need, you need see. some coaching. See. Yeah, see, 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 you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. I remember Mike saying, Les, you can do this. Mike, huh? Mike, how, man? Wait a minute, Mike. Uh, how much, how much am I going to be able to to, to, to charge, Mike, less, um, you, you, well, you could start out at $1,000 an hour. Th Mike, I don't make that working for two weeks. Come on, Mike. I, Mike, uh, man, I, I appreciate your belief in me, Mike. Look, Mike, I work for the Miami Sanitation Department. Man, I've, I've been a garbage collector. Uh, uh, you know, I've, you know, I've done door-to-door -door sales. That, that was great. And, you know, I, I'm here as a disc jockey. That's good, Mike, but... Mike, I don't think I can do that less. You can. But Mike, I don't have any credentials. I've never, I've never written any book, anything. Man, I'm, I'm not rich. How can I teach somebody to do something I've never done? But Les, why don't you just test yourself? Why don't you stretch, Les? Come on, man. Mike, I, I don't know. And here's something I, I realized. Write this down. Sometimes... You have to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief kicks in. I respect Mike Williams. Here, this young man, he, he saw something in me that I didn't see it in a strong analytical mind. And I looked at him, I always respected his thinking. And he looked at me and he made me feel special. And I said, okay, Mike. And I just kept holding on to what Mike said to me. I just kept holding on to what Mr. Washington said to me. I kept holding on to my mother saying, you're special, Leslie, when they said you're educable, mentally retarded. Mama didn't know what that meant. She only had a third grade education. So she said, he'll be all right, honey, hard head, make a soft behind, he'll be fine. <laughs> but she said, you're special, baby. You are special. And, and they kept saying that over and over again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And so here's what I want you to do. Let us say together, as you think about your goals and your dream, let us say together, it's possible together, please. It's possible. Say it like you mean it. It's possible. I had just started junior high school. And in order for me to get to high school, I had to walk through the drug dealers, literally step over the whores and the drug addicts, walk through a graveyard, then in the next block past gang members, and then go through the projects and then come to a six lane intersection and it was always busy but just beyond that was the school well one day as i'm approaching this intersection i hear this voice saying will someone help me cross he was in a suit he had a cooler in a hand and a folded lawn chair in one hand and his cane in the other will someone help me cross he said People kept ignoring him, walking past him with their busy lives. We were poor, but we were busy. I don't know why poor people are so busy. <laughs> I said, I'll help you in my 13-year-old changing voice. He said, well, thank you, son. May I have your shoulder? I wish I had time to talk about giving your shoulder to somebody. 
I said, yes, sir. He said, don't trick me now. I said, no, sir, I won't. We crossed the street. I asked him where he was going. He told me that he was going to, uh, to my school to sell perline candies to the kids. So I helped him to the school and he said, thank you. And he told me that God would bless me for my kindness. He and I became friends. We took that walk every day. I came out of school one afternoon and there he was sitting outside in that lawn chair selling praline candies, 25 cents. And I saw one of the kids try to buy candy, right? And they gave Mr. Butler a dollar and they told him it was a $5 bill. I stepped in and I said, Mr. Butler, this is a scam. Needless to say, I had a lot of enemies at that school, but it didn't matter. I was glad to do it. You see, Mr. Butler was one of the first men in my life to see me. And what made it all the more special is that he was blind. He was a point of light. One morning I was late meeting him and as I walked up to the interse intersection, I could see Mr. Butler standing there, not saying a word. So I tipped up behind him and I said, I said, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna wait to see what happens. He said, I know you're there, son. I said, yes, sir, I am. I said, I didn't hear you saying, will someone help me cross? He said, no, I was listening for you. I said, you were? He said, yes. Sometimes in life, son, when you pray and you've said all you can say, all you have to do is stand and wait and listen. What a point of light he was. <laughs> there are many people in this world that are wanting waiting, saying, asking, begging, hoping. Will someone help me cross? We all have the power to be a point of light. Thank you, and God bless you. I appreciate it so much.